This is one of those stories that really irritates me because hardworking people are being bullied, manipulated and frankly ripped off by parking management companies because they rely on you not understanding the law, not understanding the process and, in my view, more importantly and far worse, being pressured and intimidated by the legal process, heavy-handed legal letters, into paying money for parking charge notices and for claims that have no business being anywhere near a court. A court should be the last resort and it should be reserved for those cases that cannot be resolved without court intervention. But they also rely on the fact that if you go to a lawyer for legal assistance, it's going to cost you far more for that legal advice than it is to deal with a parking charge notice. So to that end, I am here to support you by going through some of these cases. Hopefully you can get some guidance out of it. Obviously it cannot be taken as legal advice because it won't relate to your specific circumstances. And even in this case, I haven't had the opportunity to ask further questions and explore it in any more detail. These are just my thoughts and my overview based on this. And just as a heads up, I do have a partner for this video because it helps me to partner with other companies in order to bring you these videos that hopefully help many of you. And I met some of you while I was on holiday. I met Neil and Neil was very grateful for watching my videos. So it's great to meet some of you guys when I'm out and about. Now, this one case that one of you guys has sent me is particularly interesting because in my view the law firm that has put this forward comes very close to the line of crossing that threshold of professional conduct in that potentially is misleading the court. I'll explain why and you can form your own views and I'm not going to name the company because that would be wrong but in my view it could be seen that they are potentially misleading the court. Let me tell you the story first and then I'll tell you why I think that. So one of my viewers contacted me and said that they parked in a place for 20 minutes or so. They paid a fee of three pounds and they put their number plate into the machine. Now, it was a hot sunny day and the machine didn't display the number correctly on the screen. In fact, he couldn't see it displayed at all to begin with. Now, the number plate wasn't correctly entered, is the bottom line. He tried to put it in, but there were duplicitous characters at the beginning. So if it was an A, it wasn't, but if it was an A at the beginning, let's say you press A and nothing appeared on the screen. So he pressed it again, nothing appeared. He pressed it even harder, thinking the, the keypad wasn't working correctly. Now, it didn't display the number plate, it just gave him a ticket, which obviously had the incorrect number plate on it. But it took the money and he'd got a ticket. So he put the ticket in the windscreen and the machine, the AMPR system, the automatic number plate recognition system, clearly did not register his vehicle correctly as having paid for parking. So they issued him with a £100 parking charge notice. Now, this doesn't really take much more than common sense in that he paid, it was an error. They gave him a parking charge notice because of the error. They were told about it afterwards. They should have cancelled it. Well, they didn't. It went through appeal and two appeals, I think, and they were both rejected. Now they've sued him. They are taking him to the county court for the parking charge notice, plus costs, uh, plus an administrative cost, all because of a simple error. Now, as I say, I think it's worse than that. But let me talk it through a little bit here. And I'll talk through why I think there's a number of points that I find this a particularly interesting case. Because there's also a code of practice, which I'll come back to in a moment. Some of you have talked about parking uh, adjudicators and uh, trade bodies and things like that. We'll come to that in a moment. First of all, let me show you this claim. This claim says here, the claim is for £100 due from the defendant for unpaid parking charge contract following a contractual breach which occurred in 2023 on this car park. Now, particular wording here, the £100 is for a contractual breach. The contractual breach set out underneath is that it's a breach of one of the terms, which was that no valid parking session was detected. It doesn't say that he didn't pay for parking. But think about this for the moment. If you are the judge looking at this uh, without any other details, just this by itself says no valid parking session detected. It reads as though he hasn't paid for parking, which he did because he showed me the ticket and he paid three pounds. I'm not even going to show you where it was, when it was, which company it was, etc. 
just that he paid the three pounds and that the machine did not correctly register his number plate, which resulted in the parking charge notice. Now, in my view, straight away, they should have said, okay, sorry about that. We can see you've paid for parking, enough said. That wasn't the case. They rejected the appeal twice and have now taken him to court. So for those of you that say, ignore them, nothing will happen, here's proof that that's wrong. They do frequently take people to court for these charges. But just before I come back to some tips that I might have for you, here is a word from my partner in this video which helps to support me in supporting you on these videos and because it's just not cost effective for you to go to a lawyer. But it is cost effective for me to do videos about them to help you wherever I can, so long as you watch my partners. So do watch this, do subscribe to their service, and I'll be back with you in a minute. Coming back to these rocks that I used to play on as a child, it reminds me of all the risks I used to take growing up. And practicing as a barrister has made me realize how many risks people take every single day. But some of those risks you can mitigate. For example, security, which is why I partner with NordVPN on my channel. I genuinely wouldn't talk to you about a partner that I wouldn't use myself. I discovered Nord many years ago. I paid for it with my own money because I was traveling up and down the country using different coffee shop Wi-Fi networks, different hotels, and there's always that niggle of doubt in the back of your mind that when you connect to another Wi-Fi system that it's just not secure. And some of them might be insecure, and there might be someone else sitting in the hotel or in the cafe who's trying to compromise your system. But NordVPN will help to prevent those attacks, man in the middle attacks, some of them are called. I don't profess to know what all of them are, but NordVPN is a specialist security virtual private network which will alert you to websites that are malicious. It helps to prevent network attacks from other people that might be on the same Wi-Fi network and also warns you of files that you might download that might be suspicious. NordVPN also keeps all of your activity online completely private because Nord does not keep any logs. You'll notice some people in the comments say that all of your activity is tracked and things like this by these VPN companies, and it's not. NordVPN has been independently audited and verified a number of times by large independent companies, including PricewaterhouseCoopers and Deloitte. They've been audited a number of times and upheld Nord's claims that there is a zero log policy. So all of your internet activity is completely private, meaning nobody on the Wi-Fi network is going to be able to spy on what you're doing, whether you're in a cafe, a hotel, an Airbnb, or wherever. Nord won't keep any logs and it will keep your browsing completely anonymous. Plus, if you're on the move and in another country, for example, and you want to access your video streaming platform from your home country whilst you're abroad, you can do this with NordVPN as well because you can change your IP address to your home country. So you can watch your favorite shows because not all shows are available in all countries because that's how licensing and copyright works. And as a partner to NordVPN, you'll find a unique link of mine in the description below with a fantastic discount. So why not check that out? It comes with a 30 day money back guarantee if you change your mind later. But with that peace of mind, knowing that if you're traveling about somewhere, you're not going to get, have anyone spy on you and your machine is going to be much more secure. So you can access your bank and everything else without the fear that someone is going to be able to hack your system. So check out my unique link in the description with four extra months free. It's a fantastic discount for that peace of mind. You get 30 days to change your mind, but of course it's just worth it for that peace of mind. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the view. And they rely, in my view, on very heavy worded letters, which I've seen, which are intimidatory and sort of force people to think about paying these. I know that to be the case because I've seen videos of people in tears having been taken to court in this process because of the stress of going to court and being accused of something that they didn't do, being hit with charges and fees and the threat of going to court. They are in tears and they say in some of these videos, I'm thinking about just paying it so that it it is over and that this whole thing is over. But as I say, the, the interesting thing for me as a professional in this wording here, that the breach, the alleged breach, is no valid parking session detected. Now on a very strict analysis here, it is potentially a breach that they could not detect the parking because the number plate was not correctly entered. But then it becomes a question of, well, was that fair? 
is it fair that the driver is held responsible for the machine not correctly picking up the number plate? Let's walk this through. Driver types the number plate into the machine, machine doesn't register it correctly, spits out a ticket with the wrong registration on it. What is the consumer then supposed to do? Try again and keep trying on a machine that doesn't display the number plate and guess that it gives the ticket with the correct number plate? What if they do that three or four times and it's still wrong? Where do we draw the line? Are they supposed to have 10 tickets before they win the lottery of number plates on the ticket and get the correct registration number on the ticket? And are they then supposed to chase the refunds for the tickets that incorrectly spit out the ticket? Because I can pretty much be confident that this company will not refund all the lots of three pounds if they've been incorrectly issued, they'll probably, according to their pattern of behavior, they'll probably still blame the driver for that. So where do we stand? Well, here's an interesting point. We're looking essentially at an error of input by the consumer. In this case, the registration number. It could be the duration. It could be a number of other things. There's only so many things you can input into a machine, right? So in this case, the vehicle registration number. So for those, we have a code of practice for several different trade bodies, motoring trade bodies, one of which is the British Parking Association. So I being me in my goals to help you on this channel, I looked up this particular company who I won't name, but I Googled around and I found them on a forum somewhere from a couple of years ago on a forum post. Somebody said they are members of the British Parking Association. Now, for those not familiar, they really should be a member of one of these associations in order to get your details, the registered keeper's details from the DVLA, uh, when they allege that uh, you've br breached their parking terms. Now, the British Parking Association have a list on their website of who are members. So I go to the member page and this company is not on it. So I think that's a bit strange. The forum post said that they are members but the current membership list does not list them. So I don't end it there. I'm a bit of an investigative lawyer. So I look at the forum post and the date, which was a few years ago. So I go back to the uh, Wayback Machine, um, archive.org. Do go and support them. There's, don there's a do donation button on there. It's very useful for things like this. So I go onto there and I look at the British Parking Association member website from that time when the forum post was made. Lo and behold, the company in question, I'm being very careful not to use the name, the company in question was a member at that time. Why is that important? Well, because the code of practice to which they would have adhered at the time or would have been required to adhere to maintain the membership at the time includes things like keying errors both minor and major keying errors, which I'll come back to in a moment, which is exactly what we're talking about in this video. And I've had more than a number of comments uh, asking, what if you've made a mistake? Well, here's what I think. It's not just what I think. This is what the code of practice says. And it says here, technology is being used more and more by parking providers as an aid to car park management. It's not the be all end all definitive word on exactly what happens, but technology is being used as an aid to car park management irrespective of whether it's on street, off street, etc, etc. Um, no one wants to receive a parking charge for making a mistake when entering the vehicle registration number into a pay and display machine or parking validation terminal when they've paid for the parking event. So they've paid for parking, made a mistake. No one wants a parking charge notice because of that. Motorists, car park operators, service providers and equipment manufacturers all have a responsibility, all have a responsibility in ensuring that obvious and inadvertent errors do not lead to unjustified charges. Now, not that this video is legal advice, but if I were going to court on this, I'd be quoting this code of practice from the BPA and any of the others that you, you'll probably find a mirror provision in the others. Uh, I'll look at those in another video, perhaps, but I would be quoting this regardless of whether they're members of the BPA or not because it's a code of practice to which they really should adhere, whether they're members or not, because it's reasonable and fair practice. It's what the BPA suggests is a fair practice. And if a term is unfair, it's unenforceable. So for argument's sake, if the term said minor mistakes are ir irrelevant, you still have to pay the parking charge notice. And if it said even if the machine is faulty, which I'm told that it was, 
that would be an unfair term, that would be unenforceable. And so an error based on the machine being faulty should not lay at the door of the consumer. That would be ridiculous. So then he talks about minor and major keying errors. Minor would be a zero instead of an O, an I instead of an L, or a one instead of an L or an I or whatever. So a single letter wrong would be a minor error. That's you looking at the keypad and typing an O instead of a zero or vice versa. Those would be minor. And they say these are minor errors. And if a typing error such as this is uh, leads to a PCN being issued and the motorist appeals, the PCN must be cancelled at the first stage of appeal. So they should not waste their time with these silly little errors and it should be cancelled. Uh, B, major keying errors. This is where they've put their spouse's registration in instead of their own or some something that is completely unrelated to the actual registration. So my viewer's case is halfway between the two. It wasn't a single letter and it wasn't the completely wrong registration. It wasn't his spouse's or whoever's registration. He'd repeated the number. Remember at the beginning, he'd put the letter in. It didn't work. He pressed it again. It didn't work. He pressed it even harder. And so he's got three of the same letter when it should have been one. So that is in between minor and major error. But for major errors, they say, in these instances, we would expect that such errors are dealt with appropriately at the first stage appeal especially if it can be proven that the motorist has paid for the parking event or that the motorist attempted to enter their VRM when a legitimate, as a legitimate user of the car park. Now, here's the ticket, because my viewer paid for the parking. I'm not showing you what registration it showed on here, because that would compromise his identity. But I've seen it, and to me, it is related to his real number plate. It was just duplicitous in the characters, and therefore it's in between a minor and a major error. But it's an error nonetheless. And so it's an error that on appeal, someone should look at it and say, aha, I see what you've done. Silly mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll cancel the PCM. That's what they should do in my view. Because here it says that they should be um, dealt with at the early stage of the first stage of appeal. It does say it is appreciated that if in issuing a PCN in these instances, the operator will have incurred charges, not limited to the DVLA fee, etc. And so they might want them to make a modest charge of £20 or whatever if a keying error was identified. So I do understand that in this case, um, that was offered, uh, a lower fee was offered, and perhaps that should have been accepted if indeed it was the user's mistake. But the reason on this instance I don't really agree with that is that this wasn't the fault, at least directly and initially, of my viewer. Because the registration was put in and the machine just didn't show it. So he pressed it again. From at least my reading of what's been sent to me so far, um, it's duplicitous in the character because the machine didn't display it properly. So that's sort of a 50-50. Really, when the, when the ticket was printed, he could have seen that it was incorrect and could have phoned them up, dealt with it, paid for another ticket, etc. But that's really unfair, making him pay for another ticket just because the machine didn't show him the number plate. If I were in court, I would say to the judge, I would say, judge, I tried to put in my number plate, but it didn't display. And so that resulted in the incorrect number plate being printed on the ticket. I felt it unfair to have to pay for another one or to wait around for up to an hour for someone to come to assist. I didn't think it'd be a problem because I had paid for the parking and I could prove it as I can prove it because here's my ticket. And I would expect, as the barrister now, I would expect the judge to accept that as a perfectly reasonable explanation as to why it's not the viewer's problem or not the viewer's fault that the ticket didn't have the correct number plate. Had it just been the the wrong number entirely had he instead put his spouse's if i've got more than one vehicle if i put the wrong vehicle in and then realize i've got a parking charge notice and they offered me the 20 pounds because it's just a, a mistake i'd have probably accepted that to be fair i'd have probably said okay you can have your 20 pounds because i put the wrong registration in it was my fault but 
if I had got a duplicitous character at the beginning, and that was the reason it was wrong, because the machine didn't display it because of the hot sun or whatever the reason was, I don't think I'd accept that. I don't think I'd want to pay this even small fee because the machine was faulty when I had paid for parking. I have got a few tips that I'll come back to in a moment, but in rounding this one off, I don't think this was fair, and whilst this cannot be taken as legal advice to the viewer or anybody else, I would be challenging this. I would be happy to go all the way to court to this and present my views. So coming back to some tips that I have when I park my car, which will help you to avoid all of this nonsense when you're out and about and parking. First of all, I try to be aware of whose car park it is whether it's a council car park or whether it's a private car park, because one can result in a fine and the other is just a private invoice. There is a difference between the two. Uh, the appeals processes are slightly different and so on. Um, but in this video, we're talking about private parking charge notices, which are not a fine. And interestingly enough, someone recently sent me this, which was actually in respect of a private car park, but it refers to it, interestingly, as a fine, which by itself might cut through the Beavis and Parking Eye judgment from the Supreme Court if somebody were challenged on a parking charge notice going to court because they themselves referred to it as a fine. So this is my first tip. Be aware of what kind of car park you are in. Secondly, you might think this is pedantic and ridiculous, but when I go to a car park, I take a photograph of the sign at the entry, the fees that are levied, and every other signage around the car park, where I've parked my car, what the bays look like, and all of those kind of things. I take those photographs. Now, we also have an app called Proofify, which if you want to be absolutely slam dunk, you can store all of your evidence on Proofify so that if ever you're taken to court, you've got it all to hand. It is worth signing up because later on, I'm going to embed within that some degree of service which will help to put claims and defenses together for you using the evidence that you store on Proofify. So it's going to be developed significantly in the coming years. So I take all of the photographs of these signage because if the signs are unclear or they're too far away or the writing's too small or the terms are unclear, unfair, what uh, contradictory, ambiguous, whatever, then they might not be upheld. It should also give you the address of the car park management company so you can write to them. And a PO box on my research is not sufficient. It should have the accurate uh, physical address. And if not, that might be challenged as well, because when they write to notice to keeper, etc., you should have had the opportunity to write to them in the first place, not just with a PO box. Examples of some unfair terms might be, well, for one, if the fee was extortionate, let's say it's five or six hundred pounds, then obviously that would be unfair and unenforceable. If they said um, you have to pay a parking charge notice, even if you don't park your car, that would be contradictory and quite ridiculous because if you didn't park, you shouldn't pay. In fact, if we refer back to the BPA code of practice, there is a grace period. Now, whilst this is not particularly enshrined in law, it would probably be upheld in court regardless of it being in the code of practice. But nonetheless, the code of practice does say that uh, the driver must have the chance to read the terms and conditions to decide whether to park because from a legal standpoint, if you don't have time to consider the terms, and if, let's say, within five minutes you think to yourself, whoa, that's expensive, I'm not parking there, you turn around, you drive out, and then they hit you with a parking charge notice, I'd be challenging that in court as well, because that would be ridiculous. My defense would be, I didn't park, so I didn't pay because I didn't accept the terms, therefore there is no contract, therefore see you in court, and hopefully the judge will see sense, but not before all of this hassle. And also, that's why I take photographs and I make a note of when I enter, when I leave. I've even had the foresight before now to write to a company where they didn't give me a ticket, as in a parking ticket, because I paid for parking, but it didn't print a ticket. It sounded and looked like it was printing a ticket, but it didn't print me a ticket. So, Obviously, it was one of these where I put my number plate into the machine and they've got AMPR. So I'm thinking, well, hopefully they will register that, that I did pay for parking, but I didn't have a physical ticket. Now, what do you do in that situation? Because you can't display the ticket, but you've paid for parking. I thought to myself, um, 
well, I'm going to park. Because, this is not legal advice, by the way. But I thought to myself, I'm going to park because I've paid for the parking. So this is one of these. I got my phone out. I've had my phone out already. So I took a photograph of the machine, said printing ticket. Uh, fee accepted, printing ticket. I took a photograph of it, but it didn't print the ticket. Um, but I did that just in case anything happened. Lo and behold, it didn't print a ticket. So I had the foresight of writing to the company and said, just in case you hit me with a parking charge notice, take notice that I will defend it because I've paid for parking. Your machine didn't give me a ticket. That was not my fault. It would not be fair to hold me responsible for that. So if you think about issuing me with a parking charge notice, forget about it and don't bother. Um, they did come back and they asked me some questions. I forget what they were now, but they did come back and I ignored that because I thought, well, I've done my bit. I've paid for parking and I wrote to them telling them what the problem was. If they take me to court, so be it. They can do that and I'll defend it. Um, but like I say, not before a lot of you are intimidated by these letters that come heavy handed and slap you with big threatening words, which are all perfectly legitimate, by the way. They are perfectly entitled to write to you to say, we're going to sue you if you don't pay, etc., etc. But these parking companies have lawyers on retainer to churn these letters out by the dozen or the hundred because they just send them out and they hope that you pay. Some of them are much more reasonable than others. I've had parking charge notices for myself cancelled before now because it was perfectly reasonable to cancel it because uh, I'll link the video below, actually, the full story below. My ticket blew onto the seat from the dashboard because I left the windows open slightly because it was in the summer, it was hot, and I didn't want the car to get overly hot. They took notice of what I said, they were perfectly reasonable, and they cancelled it. And for that, I'm thankful, because that was common sense prevailing. But if you end up in this situation, as my viewer is here, where you can get taken to court, my viewer is being taken to court. I would urge you don't panic and don't let this stress you out. If you are being taken to court and you believe that you're in the right as for what it's worth, I think my view is right here. It's not legal advice, it's just my view. I think that this is a perfectly reasonable excuse here because he paid for the uh, ticket. It was a simple mistake which, for which he should not be held liable because the machine wasn't working properly and having paid for the ticket, he hadn't ought to be expected to pay for another ticket after that. If that were even an implied term, much less an express term, I think that would be unfair, thus unenforceable, to make him pay for another one when the machine was at fault. So I would be perfectly happy defending that. But as I say, it's not cost effective to go to a lawyer to defend these claims, but hopefully these videos are useful to you. Do support my sponsor, NordVPN, because they support me, I support you, and that is how I scale my assistance on cases like this that otherwise I wouldn't be instructed on because it's just not cost effective. So hopefully that's useful to you. Please do like the video, subscribe to my channel, that's how my channel grows and I'm very grateful to you for doing that. And with that, I thank you all so kindly for watching.